Have you ever seen some cars and wondered what was going on in the manufacturer's minds when producing them? Some of these cars give a completely new perspective to what we know of insanity. In this video, we'll review the top five car manufacturers that totally made us do a double take. We have a shocker at number two. Coming in at number five is the Renault Aventime V6. Trust me, the manufacturers of the Renault Aventime V6 give a new definition to insanity when it comes to car manufacturing. If standing out was an Olympic event, this car would have been the gold medalist of what were they thinking? The Aventime, bless its eccentric heart, dared to be different when Renault was stuck in the land of yawns and German sedans. It's like the Renault looked at the automotive world and thought, let's make a car that's as attention grabbing as a fire breathing platypus. And boy, did they succeed. The result, a commercial disaster that even the most dismal French car couldn't match. The Aventime didn't just fade into obscurity, it became a cult classic, like the black sheep of the car family that everyone secretly adores. The idea for the Renault Aventime V6 was born when many French car makers decided to figure out how to shake off their reputation for being plain. While they were great at making smaller models like the cool kid Clio and the quirky Twingo, they had the itch to go big, grand, and utterly unforgettable to the non-French world. So they birthed the Aventime, a vehicle that shouted, I'm here, and I'm here to make you scratch your head in confusion. The Aventime was ready to shake things up like a caffeinated tornado. It had a cab and spacious enough to do cartwheels in, but hey, let's just toss in four seats for fun. And don't forget the two massive doors that were a breeze to open, as long as you weren't trying to do so in a windstorm. The geniuses at Renault even added a touch of magic with a double folding hinge, making you feel like a magician as you enter. Sure, kids loved the party in the back, but climbing in was like tackling an obstacle course. The Aventime was all about panoramic views, thanks to windows that rolled down like red carpet for the front seats. And the best feature? A view that was more expansive than your great aunt's stories, courtesy of a gigantic windshield and not one, but twin sunroofs. It's safe to say that when thinking outside the car-shaped box, Renault's Aventime took the cake and ate it, leaving absolutely no crumbs. The Aventime's grand entrance was more comedy show than stately arrival. Its looks promised grandeur, but the reality was more like trying to ride a roller coaster through a marshmallow. The suspension was as soft as a cloud, but someone forgot to tell it about Dan and let's not forget the orchestra of rattles that played along with every bump, courtesy of the windows and trim having a good old-time shake. Under the hood, the V6 engine was a study in contrasts. Gentle acceleration made it purr like a pampered kitten, but push it a bit and you'd unleash a roar that made you wonder if you were driving a muscle car in disguise. And boy, did it love to be pushed, especially considering the Aventime's not-so-dainty 1,720 kilogram weight. The automatic gearbox? Well, let's just say it was as slushy as a milkshake, a fitting companion to the car's eccentric character. And in the act of why not, Renault offered a manual gearbox option. As for Aventime's sales performance, let's just say it was a masterclass in how not to sell a car. Renault aimed for the stars, predicting 1,500 sales per year in the UK. Spoiler alert, they didn't even come close. The Aventime managed to find fewer than 450 buyers in its three-year stint, with just over 8,000 units produced before the curtain fell in 2003, the Aventime was like the wild hero that never quite found its place in the story. At number four, we have the Chevrolet SSR. This car is a perfect example of giving customers what they ask for, but maybe not throwing the entire kitchen sink into the mix. Let's take a trip back to the early 2000s when Chevrolet decided to play mix and match with their customers' wishes. To understand the Chevrolet SSR, you must imagine everything in one. Convertibles, pickups, and retro vibes all in one car. The result? Well, let's just say it's like throwing spaghetti, ice cream, and pickles into a blender and hoping for a gourmet smoothie. Can you imagine this oddball creation? The Chevrolet SSR resulted from a brainstorming session that went way off the rails. Chevy had some folks clamoring for a drop-top experience, others dreaming of a pickup's practicality, and a bunch pining for the glory days of classic hot rods. But nobody expected the mad scientist moment when they combined all these elements under one roof, quite literally. Now, don't get me wrong, innovation is fantastic fantastic, but sometimes even the most creative ideas need a reality check. This Chevy concoction was a prime example of how going all out doesn't always end in fireworks and confetti. It's like the automotive equivalent of a costume party gone wrong, where the cowboy, the astronaut, and the disco dancer all decided to show up as one person. Now let's talk about the daring endeavor of blending these mismatched pieces into a cohesive whole. Chevrolet took a bold leap, but instead of landing gracefully, they did a triple somersault and landed face 
first. The SSR's body was like something out of a Salvador Dali's dream journal, an abstract masterpiece that left viewers scratching their heads from every angle. And when it came to performance, well, let's just say the SSR's struggles were as real as its identity crisis. With a 5.3 liter V8 under the hood, you'd expect it to sprint, right? Wrong. This hefty beast huffed and puffed, but breaking 8 seconds for the 0 to 60 mile per hour run seemed like a distant dream. The car's biggest punchline was its price tag. At a cool $42,000 at launch, bought you the privilege of owning a car that was as unsure of its purpose as a chameleon in a kaleidoscope. You could have gotten a decent pickup truck, a lovely convertible, and maybe even a smidge of self-respect with that money. Unsurprisingly, sales flatlined faster than a heart monitor in a soap opera. The SSR's reign was brief, lasting just three years before it was unceremoniously axed. So, in the end, Chevrolet gave customers something they didn't ask for, and the SSR became a weird footnote in automotive history, a lesson in the art of overambitious design and the importance of a well-placed comma. Hot on the heels of the Chevrolet SSR is the Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet at number three. It just seems the automotive world can't get enough of odd ducks. And this time, it's the 2011 to 2014 Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet that takes the stage. The Murano itself was quite the looker when it first graced the scene in 2002. It was the crossover with a dash of flair, a mid-sized two-row wonder that balanced style and performance on a platform related to the Altima. Powered by a fierce 3.5-liter DOHC V6, it packed 245 horsepower and 246 pound-feet of torque. Back then, it made competitors like the Honda Pilot look like they were still trying to find their swagger. But we can all agree that the same cannot be said for the Cross Cabriolet. It's like the Murano had a wild night in Las Vegas, resulting in poor planning and a taste debacle. It was based on the second generation Murano, a bit like the plain cousin at the family reunion. The convertible version became a star in our ugliest cars of the 2010s list. The idea was bad, the execution was bad, and the styling? Well, it was just terrible, top up or top down. Worse yet, Nissan insisted on a paint palette full of metallic pastel colors and a white interior, making driving a Murano Cross Cabriolet feel like riding around in Zsa Zsa Gabor's wardrobe. Just in case you're not sure who Zaza Gabor is, Google will set you straight. So, just like me, I'm sure you're thinking, how did this automotive anomaly come into being? Well, we have none other than Carlos Ghosn, Nissan's CEO at the time, to blame for this monstrosity. Apparently, he had the bright idea three years before the Murano CC's appearance at the Geneva Motor Show. The sketches looked promising, or so they thought, and voila, the Cross Cabriolet was born. The Murano, once targeting affluent and aged customers, took a detour into the strange and baffling world of convertibles, leaving many to wonder if it had taken a wrong turn at the intersection of planning and sanity. The why is definitely overshadowed by the how when it comes to the Murano Cross Cabriolet, a creation that raises more questions than answers. Believe it or not, most of this convertible was a whole new deal compared to the regular Murano, requiring a serious overhaul from the firewall back. The bodywork transformed, and the entire body structure had to beef up to handle the high stance of an SUV gone rogue. Nestled under the hood, a 3.5 liter V6 engine flexed its muscles with 265 horsepower and 248 pound-feet of torque, mated to a continuously variable transmission, or CVT. And you know what's even wilder? This engine layout has remained pretty much unchanged since then. Inside the chopped top Murano, you've got space for four passengers, or maybe five if you're willing to perform a vehicle Tetris to cram one into the breadbox-sized trunk for a quick getaway. Believe it or not, used examples are still floating around on the market, with price tags ranging from $10,000 to $15,000. The real question is, would you spend that much on what I'll describe as a 4,438 pound freak of automotive design? The Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet will go down in history as the most stupid vehicle of 2011. A testament to this is its rear visibility, or the lack thereof. It was apparently marginal at best. The convertible top had two windows, a rear glass one, and a narrow rectangular plastic piece above it for the retractable rollover bars. Inside the cabin, a massive dashboard commanded attention, while the interior earned a beautifully finished seal of approval. And hey, let's give credit where it's due. The front seats were actually comfy. So, in the end, the purpose of the Murano's Cross Cabriolet's existence remains shrouded in mystery. One thing's for sure, though. This oddity won't be the 
last of its kind. Because if there's one thing the automotive world is good at, it's occasionally giving us vehicles that make us scratch our heads and wonder if they're from another dimension. At number two is the Pontiac Aztec. Pontiac Aztec, a name that's practically synonymous with automotive regret. Once the butt of the jokes and the epitome of uncool, it seems this punchline has taken a wild twist and is on the brink of being hailed as cool. We've got a hit TV series to thank for this ironic reassessment, and suddenly, everyone's churning out tales of the Aztec's newfound appeal, or should we say, appeal. But let's clear the air here. As we've boldly stated, if it's mostly cool because it's not cool, then it's really not cool, is it? And let's not kid ourselves. The Aztec is far from cool. It was, is, and shall forever remain an automotive disaster, a train wreck that you can't look away from. Pontiac unleashed this monstrosity onto the world in the early 2000s, parading it with a bizarre PR stunt involving a mock mosh pit and rainbow wigs at an auto show. It was like someone tried to disguise a minivan as an SUV and created an abomination from which even a blobfish would distance itself. The Aztec's appearance is so potent that if you spotted something remotely similar scuttling out from behind your refrigerator, you'd probably contemplate the merits of ending its life or yours. After all, even if you offed it, the memory of its existence would haunt you like a ghost. So as much as the internet may be buzzing with tales of its ironic appeal, let's not kid ourselves. The Aztec isn't having a Cinderella moment. It's more like a Cinderella story gone wrong, where the pumpkin stays a pumpkin and the glass slipper is replaced with a banana peel. No matter how hard we try, the Aztec is a relic that defies redemption, remaining a testament to the fine art of automotive blunders. The twisted tale of the Pontiac Aztec's design journey is a saga of well-intentioned ideas gone completely wrong. The origin story takes us to GM's West Coast Advanced Concept Center, where designer Tom Peters set out to blend the best of a Camaro and a Blazer into a wide, powerful off-road marvel nicknamed the Bear Claw, essentially envisioning a GMC Typhoon with off-road tires. At this point, you're just like me, and wowed by the idea. However, as is often the case with creative ventures, things took an unexpected turn. The GM higher-ups decided that this exciting concoction should be based on the architecture of their minivans, a tall, narrow structure. Did this deviation from the original concept and the inevitable compromises that came with it deter GM from bringing this oddball to life? Not in the slightest. The initial vision of the Bear Claw was a fusion of SUV practicality and off-road prowess with the thrill and performance of a sports sedan. The production-ready Aztec, powered by the corporate 3.4-liter V6 offered an optional all-wheel drive system that leaned more towards on-road prowess than anything else. Instead of creating a unique and harmonious blend, the Aztec seemingly combined the quirks of a minivan with the aspirations of a sports car. And to be honest, it was a bit like trying to turn a penguin into a ballerina. The results were questionable at best. Bob Lutz, who took over the top product role at GM after the Aztec's reign of design terror, recalled that focus groups reacted to the Aztec the way most people people did when they first laid eyes on it, with outright disdain. Some expressed their feelings, saying, quote, I wouldn't take it as a gift. You'd think this wave of negative feedback would deter the powers that be from marching ahead with the Aztec, but you better think again. It's a reminder that sometimes, even in the face of overwhelming rejection, the wheels of automotive fate keep turning, even if they're turning an unconventional, unappealing, and unforgettable weird creation. Under criticism that it was stuck in the mud of old-fashioned designs, General Motors decided to charge ahead with the Aztec, perhaps as a bold statement of, hey, we're modern too. It was an era when GM was determined to infuse innovation into its lineup, even if that innovation often left consumers thinking of the sanity of the manufacturers. The Aztec's styling was received so poorly that GM announced a restyling attempt just five months after its launch. But even that effort failed to salvage the situation. Pontiac finally bid farewell to the Aztec in 2005, and it's safe to say that its grand exit was greeted with more relief than Sara. The Aztec is like that embarrassing phase you'd rather not remember from your past, a misstep best left in the annals of automotive history, alongside other unforgettable blunders. In the grand scheme, the Aztec should remain behind the barn, gathering dust in the realm of memories. Finally, at number one is the Nissan S Cargo. Nissan's surprising response to the classic Citroen 2CV van came to life in the late 1980s. This charming oddball, the S Cargo, was unveiled at the Tokyo Motor Show, rolled off the assembly line between 1989 and 1992. Built on the foundation of the K10 Nissan Micra, production took place at Nissan's imaginative Pike factory. This model joined the ranks of other whimsical designs, such as the Figaro and POW. The S-Cargo is undeniably a tongue-in-cheek creation, right down to
to its name, a playful pun on the French word escargot, meaning snail, cleverly echoing the two CV's distinctive shape. It's as if someone went on a collage project, assembling it with boundless creativity, using whatever parts were available, and fitting them together with a bit of luck. But strangely enough, that's part of its charm. Despite its somewhat worn appearance, it seems like a vehicle that could be taken apart and repaired with relative ease. The wheel arch extensions, oversized door mirrors, and unique frog-eye headlights give the impression that they could be detached and fixed in case of damage. Under the hood, you'll find a carburetor-fed 1.5-liter single overhead cam petrol engine paired with a three-speed automatic gearbox. Stepping into the S-Cargo is like taking a nostalgic journey back to the 2CV's no-frills world. The seating arrangement is a throwback to the 2CV's style, featuring a straightforward metal-framed split bench up front and a smaller foldable bench in the rear. Even the single-spoke steering wheel takes cues from Citroen's design. Inside the driver's seat, you're treated to a surprising amount of headroom, which is quite impressive for a vehicle standing six feet tall. The driving experience is full of quirks that return to a different era. The gear stick for the three-speed automatic transmission is mounted on the dashboard, with a combined speedometer and instrument gauge right in front of you. An umbrella-style handbrake lever hangs in the driver's footwell below the dashboard. Even the heater controls are easy to operate, and there's even a switch for air conditioning, a surprising luxury for a vehicle of this kind. The unique combination of quirky charm and modern mechanical components has turned the S-Cargo into a sought-after gem in today's automotive landscape. While opinions may have been divided when it was initially launched and produced, the time has worked its magic. And now, as the S-Cargo attains classic status, its appeal is difficult to dispute. In a world full of conventional vehicles, the S-Cargo stands out as a strange yet appealing alternative, offering a driving experience that's both nostalgic and surprisingly modern. Do you think these car manufacturers were in their right minds? Let us know in the comments section. Remember to subscribe to our channel if you find this content valuable. We'll see you in the next one.